Community events on CFN, send an email to... <laughs> Now tuned to Retronics. Welcome to another piece of vintage electronics. My name is Jan Buiting. My guests today are uh, Paul Röver and Mark Simons of the Crypto Museum. And they have uh, had their arms twisted by myself to participate with uh, Retronics, the section in the magazine, which is all about uh, ancient and vintage equipment. Uh, there's a lot of old equipment on the table and these gentlemen have a lot to, to tell about it and complete with um, a, a small demo I believe which will be happening in a few minutes so stay tuned. I think I've already talked more than enough this is not my function this afternoon not at all. Uh, Mark and Paul are going to take over with their lovely crypto equipment and the PowerPoint uh, slides you're going to see on your screen. Mark, I'm handing it over to you. Complete the headset. <laughs> Don't be afraid, okay? Uh, okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, Paul and I do the Crypto Museum from 2001. And we would like to introduce you into the fascinating world of uh, cryptology, cryptology and the equipment around it. Mm -hmm. um, before you are ever going to learn cryptology, after all, we think that you should note a little bit about the history uh, because uh, cryptology has a very interesting history in forms of uh, equipment that has been made so um, when you want to put a message to a friend of yours uh, let's say uh, far away and you want this this the safe it all starts with filling in a form uh, the, the picture you see is the, the kind of form that the Germans used during the war to be able to send the messages. And here you see two guys working on it. And you see the actual Enigma. Paul will show you the real Enigma and explain you a little bit about it. OK, oh. Mr. Camera Capen over here. We have an original Enigma machine here from World War II. Um, most people will probably have seen it. Um, a small machine in a wooden, a wooden box with a keyboard, a typewriter keyboard with 26 keys and a lamp panel that produces the output. So if I press a key on this one, one of the lamps will come on. If I press the same key again, it will be a different lamp. And if I do it over and over again, I will have a different uh, encoding each time. This machine functions electromechanically. So it has electrically um, moving currents and mechanically moving wheels, which are inside the machine. And I'll quickly show you that. <laughs> because we only all want to see things from the inside. And you see wheels here. If I press a key, you will see the wheels moving. Now also, if you press a key, you will see that one of the lamps uh, comes on. Well, how is it, how is it powered, for the lamp? It's powered by a battery. It's a battery. And the battery is inside mm -hmm. a little box here, oh. which is a little uh, German Wehrmacht battery. Um, of course, there is no power in it anymore now. Okay. We've uh, opened it, cleaned it up, and put two pen lights in there. Okay, but, brilliant. Um, yeah. Basically, it works the same, and it hardly uses any power because it only needs power when you press a button. Mm. But that's how Genigma works. Um, very difficult to find these days. So, um, some time ago, we produced a small uh, self built kit yep. that does more or less the same. It's um, functionally it's compatible. Good but it's an electronic variant. Mm -hmm. It does not have uh, light bulbs, but LEDs, of course, and a little microprocessor on it. Mm -hmm. um, and a little switch somewhere hidden inside to turn it on. And it does things that the real machine does not do. It yep. says, OK, and welcome to you. So you have replicated the Enigma in a way and turned it into a pick controlled circuit. Okay. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole reason behind is that we would never dream of having a real Enigma machine. No. Okay. At least that's what we thought when we started. Mm -hmm. the collection, so that's where it comes from. At the moment it's a fundraiser for museums like Leslie Park. Yeah. So, uh, communication, com co communicating in a safe way, that's where it's all about. Mm -hmm. So, if we look at the next slide, we see mm -hmm. one of these typical radios that the Germans used to transmit yeah. the messages from, let's say, their post to one another post. And they did that by Morse code, and, you know, uh, the Morse codes were 
his was the kind of sound that mm -hmm. uh, people would hear over the air and the, the English were very good at listening in and they listened to all the messages from the Germans and they collected all their nets, their radio nets and then the English were, at Bletchley were very keen in trying to, to crack uh, the Enigma code. Yeah. So apart from creating equipment you m always have to be aware that someone will c c crack it indeed and that's a fascinating thing of cryptology. Um, one another thing uh, you should uh, note is that w once you are keen enough to develop a new kind of uh, technology, then you can uh, destroy an army of thousand Rambos. It's fascinating because you are one skilled uh, mathematician mm -hmm. trying to create something new with a, with a, with a bit of, of hardware around, and then someone will destroy an army with it, or maybe save an army or save a l lives. It's just so it's fascinating. So, proceeding to the next slide, we see, of course, the Morse code that I explained. This is, of, of course, not the way how it's done. It's done by these typical Morse keys. I've got a very small uh, design here, made from a, uh, f from a uh, I think it's a, a German guy who made it. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a Morse key that you saw on spy sets in these days. Yep. It's very ni nicely made. So, um, in Enigma, that's what it's all about uh, at the start. We are uh, talking about 1940s to 1955. But Enigma was already invented. The patents were independent of it. So, so there was nothing new on Enigma in war. Everybody knew how it worked. So, what was the thing it was that the Germans were very good in code books. So, you have to keep a secret. Uh, a secret to be able to commu 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 communicate safely. This machine has some very interesting thing that it was not obscure. So n uh, normally in older ages we uh, banded messages on sticks and the thickness of the stick was kind of uh, the way how you could read back the information. Mm. But that was obscurity. This was not obscure, this was known. So very interesting. Is it true, Mark, that the Enigmas were used for bank interbank communications? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, even b b before the war, uh, we had c companies like Shell and mm -hmm. uh, a, a couple of banks who really bought Enigmas yeah. To, yeah. To, to be able to uh, communicate uh, safely. And because we had the t t telex lines, yeah. it was all open where you could listen in and you could read the messages with plain t t text. So in this way, mm -hmm. uh, 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 secret, the only way to keep a secret a secret was to use the neck. Yeah. This is a very interesting thing you should know. When you look at the rotors, then inside one of these rotors y you have these wires. Um, you know, from this side the wire comes out there. Uh, and each time a key is pressed, one of the rotors steps and that means that the complete wires, the wires, uh, wiring has been changed. Mm -hmm. And this is how it works. So if you look at the uh, basic schematic of uh, Enigma, you can see that the, uh, that the current flows. When I press a Q, the current flows in inside the, the stacker board and then f through the stacker board to the Eintrittswalze, through the rotors, and it has a reflector on the left hand side, the, the current flows back through the rotors again and then the sticker board, hey, there is a swap from a letter mm -hmm. and then uh, the E uh, lamp burns. So when my friend on the other side has the same editing command, the same, uh, so, uh, uh, the same uh, rotor uh, uh, setting at this moment mm -hmm. and when he presses the E then mm -hmm. you can assume that from the E the current flows back exactly the other way around. So uh, that means it, it is a reciprocal thing. Um, so once you have your same rotor settings, then you can exchange things. And that's the key, by the way. Mm. The ro rotor settings is the key of the machine. Ah. So, um, you think, well, it's so old, uh, how, how could it be safe? Because you only have th three rotors. That's true, in a way, uh, with only the three rotors, you can uh, make um, three kinds of adjustments. And that is the order of the rotors inside the machine. Paul will uh, dismantle the machine a bit so you can have a look at it. So um, uh, the, the rotors are, are on an axle and you can remove them from the axle and you can swap them. choose. Uh, you can swap the rotors from 
three places of, and the choice of five rotors. So in this little box here we have two more mm -hmm. and they are numbers one to five and in a, in a code book of that specific day uh, it was explained that in, from, from uh, now on you should use rotor two, five and three or something. So you, uh, you put them into the machine. But there is something more, you can, from each rotor you can change the ring setting it's called and uh, the ring setting is it is the number, uh, the numbers ring offset by the wire ring. So uh, when I change this, you can see that only the ring changes, but uh, the, 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 the wire ring is stable. Mm -hmm. So in this way, I can. The only thing I do is change the position of these notches here. The, the and these notches. Um, make the next rotor move. So the wiring changes around these notches actually. So that's my second uh, setting and the third uh, setting is the basic setting. If I close the lid I see the numbers and that's the basic setting of the rotors. So th these were the three settings I have. Exactly, the Agnico has been set now by Paul. So. Uh, when I uh, c c calculate the complete number of possibilities I just explained, then we see uh, two, uh, se 712 million possibilities, only by this. But there is something more, because before the war, uh, the Germans were so smart to introduce the stacker board. And Paul will explain something about that. Okay, well we've seen 712 million combinations. At the time it must have been a tremendous number. However, the German army um, decided it was not enough and they added this plug board at the front of the machine. Now, you have a, a plug or a, um, a contact for each of the letters, so 26 of them, and you can bridge them. So, if you put a wire between A and E, then those letters are swapped in pairs. A is swapped for an E and E is swapped for an A. Um, imagine how, how many cables you can have on here. None, for example or one, or two, in any combination you can think of, up to 13. And the mathematical optimum lies at, at around 11 cables, I think. The Germans decided to have 10 cables on the machine at all times. So if you look on the screen, you have about 150 million, million, million combinations. Multiplied by 712 million that we already had, gives you a tremendous number, um, which is more or less equal to 76 bits if you calculate it in modern day bits. Compare that to your bank card which is 56 bits only <laughs> and you can see how secure Enigma was at the time or how insecure your bank card is at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as I already told, the patents were there. The, this is a picture from uh, 1923. Mm -hmm. so it all, it all already was known. It's the number of combinations that is making a very hard beast to, to, to c crack down. So, uh, you might think that Enigma was the only thing that Enigma was, was this, but there were different models around. And we were lucky because we met a guy, his name is Frodo Weirut. He's investigating lots of uh, things uh, with Enigma. And uh, Paul and uh, Frodo decided to create a kind of a let's say, um, um, a, a family tree? A family tree or something. And this, is, uh, this picture shows you the number of different enigmas around. And we uh, t travel around to ha uh, have a look at things and we found one very special one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because we had, a, we had a contact in Hungary, it was a very vague picture of a Paul found on, on the, the internet and he tracked down uh, the guy to take this picture and he explained to, 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 to Paul, well, I made a trip to Hungary years ago and it must be something we were on a hill or something. It was in a museum, that was all we had. So we uh, called a friend of ours in Austria and he, he, and he called around again and then we found this particular museum and that was very nice because um, uh, we had a new friend. How's, how's your Hungarian? Uh, 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 it is horrible, it is horrible. But the drinking was um, good? Uh, the man in, in, the, in the, the, the white, uh, a shirt. He was <laughs> uh, he was originally uh, originally from uh, Germany, huh? uh, and he spoke Hungary uh, Hungary 
as yeah. well. Yeah. And it, it is a language you can never learn. It's just impossible. Um, yeah. I just uh, remember one word is please, and that is a render, re render ref or something. I don't know. So uh, it's uh, time to move on a little bit in history. Mm -hmm. um, before um, before the era we are t t today, a lot a lot has happened, and mainly we start with rotor machines um, because Enigma is also a rotor machine. Uh, the rotor machines have been created until the electronics arrived, mm -hmm. and uh, this is one example. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes, um, we've, we've now seen Enigma machine, of course, but uh, other countries had similar machines to Enigma. Enigma was German. The British had a machine which was called uh, Type X, um, and the Americans had a machine which was called Sigaba, or Sigaba in, in European. Similar machines, same rotor principle, keyboard, but some of the machines printed to mm -hmm. uh, to paper or to a paper strip. Mm -hmm. uh, just after World War Two. The Americans and the new NATO were looking for a new machine to use for uh, all their troops. Yeah. Um, that became this particular machine. It was developed by the NSA. Um, extremely rare at the, at the moment, but the machine works at the same principle. It has moving rotors. Um, I'll try to point them out here in front. You will see the little windows there where the, um, where the wheels are behind. There's a keyboard at the front, but unlike Enigma, which has lamps, you will have it on a a piece of uh, paper strip here, so it will be printed by a small printer from an electronic typewriter which is mounted mm -hmm. in the front. This machine served from the early 1950s, I would say, to um, the mid-1980s, believe it or not. <coughs> it even has valves in them, tubes, yeah. for uh, switching the electronics. So, um, ancient, mm -hmm. ancient electronics, but still functional. If you connect it to 24 volts, it will come alive in it will run happy. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a guy in Belgium, uh, Dirk Rijmenant, he, he, he's called, he, he created a, a simulator for this. Uh, because in a way this machine still is a little bit of a secret, because there was a spy thingy behind it. But I'll advise you to look at our web page and yes. have a look at it. Cryptomuseum.com. Yes. I do have a look on the website because the, the simulator is known to work correctly. Yes. And it has not been reverse engineered from a machine itself, uh -huh. because that's still illegal. Mm -hmm. It's done purely from observation. So by looking at the machine, see how the rotors move, mm -hmm. uh, do that for weeks and, and we managed to get a reliable simulation of it. And that was very useful. You can download it for free. Now, uh, uh, the Russians, they were not stupid at all. They were very smart. Um, in 1950s, the start of 1950s, they developed this con this small machine. It's on our right-hand side. Um, it is a, um, uh, from that time, a very compact machine. It is a printer, a puncher, um, a, a crypto device in one. It's actually a full uh, Tech type machine, a TX yes. machine, or whatever you call it. It has a motor, so it's motor driven, it has a keyboard, and it does not have um, four or three uh, wheels like the Enigma, but it has ten moving rotors. And unlike Enigma, where one rotor moves one step at a time, mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is carried on, one, the, the rightmost rotor has made a full revolution. This one moves very irregularly, and hopefully, when the old electronics still work, I can show it to you. It'll make a lot of noise, so bear with me. And now we'll start tugging it. Now look carefully at the, at the rotors, and you can see that some of the rotors move forward, while other rotors move back. Yep. Very irregularly tugging, um, making it a very, very complex machine. Um, I think it's around 2005 when we found the first of these machines um, mm -hmm. in working condition and we started researching it and we came to the conclusion that the Russians must have known everything about the Enigma um, that was around in World War II, which the Allied forces kept secret and not until the mid-1970s. But unless what they thought, um, the Russians must have known it all along and must have known exactly what the weaknesses of Enigma were. Because mm. the Enigma does have a couple of yeah. very nasty weaknesses that helped Codebreakers and Blessed Park during the war to break that machine. Now, all these um, negative sides of Enigma, all these problems are cured in this machine. Um, just to name a quick example, on an Enigma machine, if I press the letter A, 
it can be translated in any letter except the letter A itself. Because it's a reciprocal operation, the current cannot flow forward and back through the same wire, so therefore a letter can never be encoded into itself. On this machine, which works in the same manner, the Russians have solved that principle by using a small electronic circuit with mm -hmm. three transistors. Um, and imagine this was designed in 1956. Transistors? Transistors, three, three of them. With a very clever binary rotating uh, circuit. And it took us a little while to understand what the circuit does. It only has three diodes, three transistors, <laughs> and five <laughs> resistors. Cute. And we actually had to run a simulation in SPICE to know exactly what it did. But it did what we expected. Very clever piece of circuit. You can read all about it on the website. Um, but nice machine has been around um, in the um, Russian-speaking world and in all the Eastern Bloc countries, the former Warsaw Pact countries, for, for many decades, until the 90s, I believe. And it, rumor has it that certain countries like Cuba are still using this machine. Uh, we don't know for certain, but um, we have a that they are still in use in some countries. So, right on. So we are... Um, We've covered uh, Russia, America and Germany. Yeah. What else? So um, the, uh, uh, you got to realize that, that this fought against that, in a way, because mm -hmm. the, 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 they were used in the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Uh, from rotor machines, we step to electronic machines. This is a very rare KL51 uh, crypto machine. Um, uh, completely e electronic, and you might conclude that today it's unbreakable, still. Even today. Uh, we know that it has some algorithms inside that are NATO approved, that you cannot break. So even today it's very hard. Uh, the electronics is old, it, uh, the, the microprocessor might run on 4 MHz or something. Mm -hmm. it's just, it is just an 8-bit or a 16-bit microprocessor, an 8080 or something. You know? something that might be in this rack from yeah. Jan's collection. Oh yeah, absolutely. But um, <laughs> it, it is made in a military way. It's very good, uh, very rock solid design, uh, very much safety around. It's aluminum, it's weighing a ton of this thing. It's, it's just uh, 20 kilos or something, it's horrible. Um, it's all, uh, the communication is all based on p p paper tape. It's the same tape that's coming out from the Fialka machine. Paul will show you a bit of it, yeah. and it runs inside this as well. So you put your message in here, and Excellent. then you have to start. Uh, you, have, you can put your message in here, and then you can um, st start. It's running, and it, mm -hmm. it will encode your message or decode whatever you want. Uh, it, it's still working, but we've only got one. So that's all, always a thing. When you connect these, you want two because then you can play around. But normally, it's very hard to find it. So. It's a unique anyway. That way it is, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely to, unique. Yeah. We'll have to wait until the second part. Yeah. Comes. yeah. But so um, uh, if we there's any readers uh, watching, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Know, if you have, uh, please, con around, please contact uh, us. Please, if you have free around, uh, these, please contact us. Very welcome. We're always interested. Uh, yep. So what um, other stuff? Yeah, uh, phones. Right. Let's so over The crypto telephones. Um, many of them have been made. I'll get forward a little bit. Yeah. And put it on the table. This is just an example of one of the phones that was used in the White House for a little while. I uh, think between two uh, other crypto phones in. Um, very, very difficult if you come to think that the, uh, the bandwidth of a normal telephone line is very, very low. Uh, runs only from 300 hertz to, say, 3000 hertz. You cannot do a lot of digital encryption on that. So most systems at the time used voice scrambling. As a voice scrambling mm -hmm. uh, basically cuts the speech in pieces, mm -hmm. and scrambles them and um, transmits them. Very easy to break, especially with modern computers, because you can see that the sine waves do not match. Mm -hmm. and you can actually put them in, in the correct order again and make it audible. This is one of the very first really digital phones that worked through a normal telephone line, simply by taking human speech, uh, disassembling it into the um, the, the, the building blocks of human speech, like pitch, noise, um, um, the tone height, etc. Then you, you, you broadcast these individual items and at, at the receiving end you synthesize the speech again, basically. It sounds very unnatural. You get a bit of a Donald Duck style voice and you cannot uh, recognize the person at the other end. So that's another problem in cryptography. You, I'm not certain that you're talking to the person that um, that he says he is. So you have to find other ways of um, authenticating uh, the person. But 
the phone works and we do have two of these so yes. this one we can demonstrate we won't do it today it takes a lot of time it works with 2400 bouts like an old modem and sometimes it needs to resynchronize especially with modern telephone lines which are digital these days and do audio compression themselves tones do not like that mm -hmm. so 2400 baud modems are not happy with the modern telephone lines again right uh, from phones and uh uh, trying to encode and decode speech into elements. I, I have to say that, by the way, I have, to, I have a whole collection of, uh, of crypto phones. You can look on the website. We even have Obama's current telephone, ah. um, the one that has been used recently. Um, that was found on a flea market in the Netherlands, believe it or not, new in the box. It does happen uh, every now and then. Uh, and it is fully functional. So, um, Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the the uh, amazing thing is that, that mistakes are made and uh, we are always keen to find things uh, that we, uh, yeah, of course we are uh, careful, uh, we are not stupid, so if we find things that really cannot be in the field then we warn people of course, mm -hmm. but uh, this phone without the proper crypto card doesn't do anything wrong, so mm -hmm. I mean, Good. Um, the next thingy we have got here on the table is a small crypto, a modern crypto uh, thingy. It's, it's the device mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a kind of a terminal adapter, a uh, secure to, to, to terminal adapter. Very plastic. Uh, one. Yeah, it is. Ah. But, I hate that. But it's 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 uh, the electronics inside is sublime. Good. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, FPGAs, modern microcontrollers, 32 bits. That's where it's all going. Mm -hmm. But. Hey, the problem is now that you have this box here. If you compare it to this machine here, then yeah, well, uh, which of you, these would you like to have? Yeah, uh, it is not sexy. It's not sexy. It's not sexy anymore. <laughs> no. um, it doesn't have um, any movable parts. Hence the plastic. A couple of buttons so, and, and a display, probably. If you're so right. if you if you are looking at the the, uh, the modern electronics at in, in in these days, cryptology. This is an, a military thing. Uh, cryptology is a very uninteresting in a way of moving parts. It has moved from the rotor machines towards real electronics. Mm -hmm. and, but still, the mechanisms inside are fascinating because in software you can mm -hmm. make a rotor, you can make a rotor run in software. I mean, with a bit of code you can actually simulate Enigma. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. So if you have an Arduino or, or a Raspberry Pi at yep. hand, yep. give it a try. And we have, we have a, whole, uh, a speech in, 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 in the Nijmegen here. A guy from, let's say, 13 years <laughs> came at <laughs> us and he wrote down software for uh, uh, emulating the Enigma. Fascinating. Yeah, really I find it brilliant. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there's even an Arduino uh, design at the moment around uh, by a guy who did a wonderful job and even produced the German fonts, so the, mm -hmm. the German um, yeah. old, 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 um, old uh, font, what is it, a uh, fractal font, on an Arduino. Really nice. It does a full Enigma simulations with three buttons only, so have a look at on YouTube. It's really very nice. It is a kind of a watchy uh, yeah. display. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Probably yeah. if you type Enigma and watch, you will yeah. you'll find it. You'll find it, yes. So, uh, in these uh, days, we have these amazing microcontrollers. This is, this is just an example. Mm -hmm. The iMix uh, the 6, Paul and I are into electronics ourselves, and we created something with it. Uh, on the left bottom side, you see this security engine. It is a complete uh, secure uh, um, mm -hmm. thing. You can do all kinds of uh, modern uh, cryptology with, with it, from AES to DES, triple DES, whatever you like. Uh, remember that these standards are standards, so everybody knows how these standards are made. This, this, this is a thing you should keep in mind. A little bit of obscurity cannot be too bad. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's what I think. Um, so. Skipping this, we come to our small uh, replacement of the yeah. rotor machines. It's also a, a electronic variant of the of the uh, real Enigma. It is compatible. It's just a fun thing. Yeah. Don't buy it because it's sold out. So uh, we we don't but have we'll anything on But we'll have new ones. For due course. Okay. Um, apart from um, doing cryptology, there are spying around because people. Mm -hmm. um, ha ha are in a position somewhere in the world that they find uh, something out that a country wants to know. For instance, uh, a Russian is spying in the Netherlands or we are spying in, uh, in Arabia or whatever. 
um, spying, has, spying has always been uh, there. And in the 50s, the only way to tr transmit your messages to the other side of the world was mm -hmm. by teletype, yeah, by yeah. sending messages, but that they could all be, all be read and the transmitter and receiver were known. And, yeah. But the, the other way around was to send it by yourself with a secret t t transmitter. So here is a Russian spy set used to transmit from a hotel room somewhere in the world to home base. And the way they did that, the, the way they um, made messages is by so-called one-time pads. And these one-time pads were actually smuggled in uh, and they used it to create the, the messages. Um, I think I have a picture of it. It's, it's the orange thing. Is this, yeah. this, is a, this is the picture of it. Uh, it is a very small book, booklet of thin papers. Um, you write down these numbers and then you receive numbers by shortwave. They send you the message by shortwave. And with this typical radio you would receive your messages. You would just listen in a shortwave frequency somewhere. Maybe you remember these number stations. Yep. Uh, we know these yep. number stations. We heard them on the radio. But t t today they are rare. Uh, the number stations just uh, taught you uh, um, a, a range of uh, numbers and you had these numbers and they learned you a kind of a sum and then text would come out and then you had an instruction what to do. And you, all, all, you also had numbers to be able to create a message and to send it out by to transmit by Morse code, as you see here. This uh, small thingy here is the same thing as I had before. It's, it, it is a Morse mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A key. Mm -hmm. This tr transmitter has something very unique. You can burst encode your messages by clicking a cassette on it and transmit it in a split of a second. In this, this way, they were not able to, to uh, locate you anymore. Yes, to use radio direction finding. Because radio direction finding is one another thing. With a couple of antennas, you can cross lines and know that you are in this particular hotel transmitting your secret messages. But if you only burst for a couple of hundred milliseconds, then, then yeah, yeah, yeah. you are uh, undetectable. So like um, Mark explained, the, um, the transmitter on the right was used for uh, sending messages, let's say, from here to, uh, to Russia or to uh, Berlin, to East Germany. But most of the spies used an ordinary radio to receive messages because you would not attract any attention if you bought this in a That's just a plain radio. This is an ordinary digital World Sony receiver um, thing. ICF 2001 radio. Yeah. Very popular among Russian spies, yeah. uh, just like the uh, Grundy satellite Z2000. Satellite boy. Uh, World class and, um, uh, receiver. Um, Mark also explained these number stations that you could hear on the shortwave uh, in German, for example. Yeah. Uh, drei, sieben, yeah. acht, neun. What those numbers actually were, were codes in an unbreakable uh, encryption. And that's what the one-time pad was. Um, if this booklet that Mark has just shown you the picture of contains truly random numbers, and you convert your message into numbers first, and you add one of these numbers to the numbers of your message, uh, if this is noise, or random, then your message will be random. Uh, because noise plus something useful is still noise. Now, there's only one copy of this booklet, and that's at the other end of the communication link, in, let's say in Berlin or in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And if we both agree that we use this booklet only once, or we use one page only once, and immediately after use we destroy that page, then there is no way that somebody can ever break that code again. Because there's no relationship between the noise and, um, and your message. Now, the, the real difficulty with this is how to get this into a country. If you are a Russian spy operating in the Netherlands, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. uh, <laughs> one day the pages of your book will be out. Yeah. You have to smuggle a new <laughs> booklet into the country. Man. Well, what I did is they used Shaving! This. Yes. This is a travel book. It's a smell, Paul. Shaving it, smell. It is really old. It, it's uh, dirty yeah. and There's <laughs> a small mirror and clip, pliers, brush. A small brush and it's hidden. You yes. Well, hidden. this is basically uh, a, a normal travel kit that mm -hmm. um, gentleman's travel would, kit. Yes, we yeah. would travel around with. If you would take a needle somewhere and stick it in a hidden hole here at the bottom, mm -hmm. then this would come off and you could click this away, uh -huh. and that reveals a little secret hiding place. Now, inside that hiding place was yeah. this little thing that would carry a false passport 
because you would need it as a yeah. spy, yeah, sure. a false identity, and, 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 and this little booklet with fresh numbers. That's how they smuggled that into the country. Brilliant. Um, and this one is actually confiscated in the Netherlands by our secret services um, mm -hmm. around 1969, we believe, mm -hmm. uh, along with one of those railroads. Brilliant. Nice. So uh, 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 the one-time pet is actually the only way to save, to do safely encryption. Um, lots of information from spies and two spies were never cracked down. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing to find out is to go to a former Eastern country, go to the archives and search it over there. We know of a couple of people doing that. And uh, uh, for instance, Christoph Klerks, he's, he's a writer from uh, Belgium. He has written this very nice book on spying in, um, in, in, in Belgium. And he just traveled around to Europe to find the real stories from the other side and combine these two stories and it's amazing, it's amazing. It's uh, just, uh, just, to know, to, just to inform you about this. Um, uh, there's the stories behind it and the people, the meeting the people is one of the nice things about this uh, policy. So, um, one another thing crypto cryptology has been involved into is our, our secret army. We had a, in, a, in to, to complete Europe we had a secret army and uh, now we know it's, it's called as Gladio. Um, and it was a state behind army. Uh, we were afraid f uh, of the Russians after after war to, to time uh, after the Second uh, World War, and uh, through all through all the complete Europe, we uh, kind of mm -hmm. developed a secret army to, to be able when the Russians would, would arrive, then we could, we could do something. Uh, not as in Second World War, we had nothing in in the Netherlands. There was nothing. Uh, we had to organize from uh, England, and we know all these. Things about the England spiel, for, uh, uh, for instance, it was horrific. Uh, p p people just died around, and it was very hard to build up an army in the Netherlands again when the Germans were here. That's the whole thing. So we we d had decided NATO-wide to use transmitters and cryptology to be able to uh, cr create a, uh, an army and to be able to commu communicate with the, the, with different uh, sections inside the army. Uh, here you see the crypto. Sitting here. Yeah. Yeah, That's a completely yeah. modular design, so we can take the crypto box out and conclude it vertically. Now, this whole radio was designed basically because every country had its own radio set um, some from Germany, some from America, some from England, mm -hmm. and they all worked in a different manner, different uh, cryptography. Uh, different burst encoders to send quick messages. So, um, one machine should solve that problem. Now, the order was given to um, Telefunken in Germany in 1980, and the machine had to be ready in 1990. So they had about 10 years to develop this thing. Um, I think in total they made 847 of these machines, uh, 110 of which were for the Netherlands, around 250 for Germany, mm -hmm. the rest we do not know. These machines costed, at the time, around 150,000 guilders. My goodness. Yes. So divide that by 12.2 and you know how many euros that is. It's an enormous amount of money. Um, a couple of these machines have been around for a little while, um, but without the little crypto box. And um, a couple of years ago, suddenly they turned up on eBay, believe it or not, um, um, from a junkyard. So um, you could buy them for a price uh, per kilogram aluminium, basically. Uh, the machine is still in full uh, working condition. It is fully modular. You see two batteries at the front here, a little receiver, um, there's a transmitter with an antenna tuner, and a full power supply there, and of course the, uh, the crypto box. And Mark has a little nice gadget to show you, which sits on top of the crypto box normally, and that's a little toolkit, you could say. It has little uh, connectors, a little mm -hmm. telescopic antenna, mm -hmm. um, plugs, earphones, spare batteries, uh, and even a little diagnostics tool that you can click on any of these modules to, um, to test their functionality and to see if they're still uh, in working condition. Even if your antenna tuner breaks down and you can no longer use your transmitter, there is a dummy load in there that allows you to, to uh, consume about half the power so that you won't blow up your transmitter and connect it to an antenna. Now the whole idea of this transmitter was that you would no longer need 
um, radio amateurs, for people who were capable of uh, giving and taking Morse code, mm -hmm. because that was considered too dangerous. The, the Russians had long lists of all radio hands in Europe, and they would be the first to be killed um, if they would cross the border and, um, and come to, um, to occupy Europe. So the idea of this radio was to have a so-called single agent concept, so that um, a secret agent would be able to operate a radio without any technical knowledge whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it's a fully automated system, working on shortwave. It has a guaranteed range of 6,000 kilometers, which is not bad. Um, the whole reason for that was that it was considered that the, the base station would no longer be in England, but in the US, because uh, Russia already had uh, atomic bombs. Um, so England would not, not stand a chance. Um, so if, you, if the base station was in America, you, you needed that long range uh, of 6,000 kilometers. For that they used a very specific type of modulation, because with normal modulations, FM or AM or single sideband, you cannot uh, cover that distance with such low power. Um, so they devised a variant of VSB, vestigial sideband, which is also known from uh, certain uh, TV uh, systems mm -hmm. that allow you to, to broadcast digital information um, somewhere hidden in the noise, you could say. Reliably, I think a message of about uh, 500 characters, which is a normal secret message, takes about 0.3 seconds to send to the other side of the world. So. The machine was ready in 1990, and two years later the whole network was, um, um, was closed. Um, but the no longer needed the, um, the, the secret armies because there was no longer an enemy in the east. Uh, the Berlin Wall had fallen, so um, that, that was the end of the whole what we call Gladio network. And these machines ended up in the warehouses of the uh, military services. Well, we believe that they still are in the warehouses. They still are. They probably still are. Yes. Yeah. But one is here, so it's, you can have a look at it and realize what you can do with it. And it's very interesting because now you are able to communicate with your friends or actually you are c able to communicate with home base because what they did is they were they would not allow you to communicate with your friends because that's too dangerous so it were small cells operating autonomously very interesting uh, you read about it on our website we have stories about it and we have met people working for these organizations very interesting so the only the only secret way of com communication we think is one time pad but there are lots of nice electronic things around on, let's say, computers. Um, if you really would like to communicate in a safe way, we suggest writing down on paper. For <laughs> me. Real <laughs> secrets are written down on paper yeah. and stored away in yeah. the, uh, somewhere. <laughs> so that's actually our presentation. Yep. Thanks, uh, Mark and, uh, and, and Paul. Uh, Retronics been very happy to uh, have these guys uh, over, especially not for the presentation. I'm, I'm a hardware guy, as you all know, with all ancient equipment and the table. I just love it, all the, uh, the, the equipment, and, and I would just dream of you just driving away with your car empty. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I can describe all of this perhaps in a future, at a future date in the magazine or whatever. Perhaps we'll have an occasion to do that as part of Retronics. Thank you very much everybody for, uh, for watching. This was uh, the show from Elector House. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Buiting. I'm the editor of Elector Magazine. Thank you everybody. Bye bye.